Hello, brothers and sisters, what a joy to see you, what a joy to spend some time with you. I just want to assure you and uh, want to uh, re re-emphasize the power of prayer, the power of our privileged relationship and access to the throne room of God. Um, Jesus Christ is the twain man between us and God. He redeemed us. He, he laid himself across that unpassable uh, gap between us and the Lord. He ended the war that we were in enmity with the Lord. We were on Satan's side. And he ended that war. And thus, and it's incredible. We have the privileged access to go into the throne room wearing the righteousness of Christ because God Almighty can't be near sin. He has to judge it. So we're wearing the righteousness of Christ, thus the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, Christ's truth, the truth that he is Lord, the peace, the, go the shoes that quickly lead to the gospel of peace, the prince of peace, the only one through through which we might have peace is through Christ the King, the faith without which it is impossible to please God. The faith protects us from all those fiery darts of the enemy. The, the sword of the Spirit, his Spirit fills us, the Spirit of his Word. Jesus is the Word. The word in the beginning, the Word was with God. The Word was God. So we need to come into an a corporation of understanding, a transformation of our minds, that we're not troubled by the things in this world. And folks, that's why I'm sitting here praying for you, because prayer is the greatest thing I can ever do for anybody, including myself. And that is to acknowledge the relationship that I have with Almighty God, the, on, the only God in the universe, and acknowledge him and acknowledge that I need to look to the heavens from whence all my blessings come and inquire of God for assistance. Now, he's got his plan and he's already intervening. I don't know the mind of God. I don't know what he's doing, but I know he's doing it. And that's called faith. That's called, you may call it blind faith. They may, you know, use it in the pejorative and say, you're blind. Well, amen. Amen. I am I am blind. I do have the blinders on, not of this world, not of looking at the shiny objects or looking at the mundane ruts in front of me that my wheels must follow or my hoofs must follow, but but looking upon the blinders of I'm not going to get captured by all of this shiny objects, all of this deception in this world, because I don't belong to this world. And that's the basis of preparation for the church. Why would Jesus teach readiness? Why would the apostles teach readiness for Christians if denominational Christianity is the truth? If you're once saved, always saved, and you can just go ahead and do whatever you want, then why would you have to be ready? It, 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 strain, it strains incredulity. You know, incredulity, excuse me. I'm poor pronunciation, pronunciation, right? Oftentimes we have to slow down. And as the world speeds up, the need to slow down is of greater importance. It takes on a whole new sense of urgency that we need to remain focused, focused on not on ourselves, but upon the Lord. You know, amen, I have the blinders on. I can focus on Jesus. I can focus on this name, for there is no other name by which we may be saved. We're all in this boat together, and the outcomes are God's, and the judgment is God's, and the end and the beginning is God's. So me pursuing my own outcomes with my own in, in you know, my own lack of assurance, my own, um, you know, absurdities, my own desires, my own flesh, or my own inadequacies. It's just foolish. I must, I must have a compunction in my heart consistent with the faith that I've been given to pursue God's truth in his word 
not the truth of my own fear or the truth of my own lusts or whatever is prompting my own desires. What I'm here for is to pursue that truth that sets a man free, and that truth is that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the only truth that sets a man free. And thus Jesus Christ being Lord, thus him having redeemed me means he purchased me back, means I am now a slave to righteousness. I am covered in his righteousness as Abraham was imbued with God's righteousness because he believed. Do we believe? Do you believe? Do you really contextually believe to a point where you realize you're here is serving God? You're not here to serve yourself or man or fears or, or greed or, or make a name for yourself. You're here to serve his objectives, and his objectives are made very clear in his word. Paul is painstakingly clear. He says the reason you were given gifts is because Jesus loves you and he wants for you to a, a, attain his purposes. And what are his purposes? A doctrine of perfection. We're to be set apart, holy and righteous, true. Be as be holy, even as I am holy. None of this mealy mouth denominational Christianity. There are no denominations in heaven, folks. So that you've got a context right there. If you're in a denomination and there are no denominations in heaven, you're automatically in in some type of contrast or conflict with the Lord. Face it, Thyatira, Sardis. Philadelphia and Laodicea, cold, hot, and lukewarm, and the medieval church, the Roman church, that will go into tribulation very clearly. The Sardis, the denominational church, the cold church, that will go into tribulation if it is not careful. It doesn't turn back. Philadelphia, the hot church that's going to be saved from tri tribulation, and Laodicea, the apostate church, the lukewarm church that's that's going to disobey God and going to be apostate and going to be outside of God's will and will go into the tribulation because it's lukewarm. It'll be included among the, the dead and the evil because they fail to make a choice for Christ. So what? how does readiness apply in Christianity if there is no rapture? Because we know the day and the hour he will land upon the Mount of Olives. We know that it's 1260 days past a certain event, right? The abomination of desolation. The indications in, within the tribulation that are meant in Daniel 9 to for, foretell the coming of grace to the Jews. The end of their iniquity. Folks, we need to understand why does Edom and Moab and Ammon escape the thumbprint of Antichrist? Because there's obviously something God is doing there to protect. What is in Ammon? What is in, in Moab? What is in Edom? Petra! Are we beginning to get the context of our understanding and the need to understand what's coming? What we are facing is the rise, not, not of an empire, though it'll be an empire, not of a man, though it'll be a man but of a war against God, an antichrist war, standing against his coming, his dominion. And he will crush that empire, as in, in, in Daniel 2, that empire of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It will be crushed, and he will set up the final empire. Now, we either believe that or we don't. That's Christianity. Christianity is not whatever we've made it throughout history. It is what God proclaimed to us in the Bible. And if we've changed the Bible, folks, you can't change it from the original manuscripts. You can't change the Pentateuch. You can't change the, the, the Bible that was written in Greek in, in roughly two, 270 uh, BC. You can't transform texts that still exist. You can't add books to the Bible in in 1547 as the as the pope did and call it the apocrypha and suddenly you have the right to transform god's word you don't have that right there is no hierarchy in the church there is no one 
above or below. We are all equal brothers and sisters in the same family. That That's a hypocrisy. That is part of why that church, the hierarchical denominational church, will go in to tribulation. Because they've decided that, you know, there's a hierarchy in the church. Look, there's only one leader of the church, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of the body. We are the body. It doesn't say we're, you know, you're the brain and I'm the toe, so therefore I'm less important. That's not how it goes. How it goes is that we face all this in joy. We face it together, perfecting the saints, working the ministry, and edifying the body, preparing it. What Preparing it for what? What do you have to be prepared for? The only hope we have is to escape the coming tribulation, escape God's wrath. Therefore, you are, are, you know, there is no further condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. We're not appointed unto wrath. So there has to be an avenue of escape. If you want escape, rapture is that escape. Escape, And I can see why the enemy want, would want to feed your mind that rapture doesn't exist. But it does. Study it. You'll see it in the Bible. It's very clear. Parpazzo. Rapture. And that's the reason why we ready ourselves, while we have oil in our lamp, oil that when the master comes to snatch us out of here, we're able to walk out and see him. It's the oil of the Holy Spirit. He's able to see us very clearly, sealed in the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, proclaim the son and daughter, sons and daughters of God, princes and priests, you know, princesses and priestesses adopted into the kingdom of the Most High God. Folks, it all makes sense, but this world doesn't want you to make that sense because the enemy is a deceiver. The enemy is always going to try to get you off the path onto the broad boulevard that leads directly to Hades, leads directly to hell, folks. You get on the broad boulevard of, of social acceptance, where are you headed? There's way that appears right to a man, but its steps lead directly to Hades. That's the word. If you are following your own thoughts and your own conceptions and you're not following God's word, guess where you're going to end up? I'm going to a place that I don't know, a place where it's located where I don't know how to get there. How can I say that I'm going to follow my own road when I need directions to get there? And who's the director? The Holy Spirit. Guide me into the knowledge of all truth, the skinny path, the only path. You know, broad is the expanse that led, leads to hell, but skinny, narrow. That's the path we're following is a narrow path. And if you want to, you know, sign on with a broad understanding in the world, then logically there's going to be a difficulty. There's going to be an error in my thinking. There, it's a natural repugnance to what God is saying that, that you know, many many are called, but few are chosen, because we won't listen. Because we're ready, listening to something better. We're ready, like Eve, looking over the gates for the the better man, looking uh, looking at, at tall, dark, and handsome, looking across the the fields of grass on the other side that's greener than our own. The greed that leads me to envy other men. The you know, I want his horse, I want his wife, I want his land. I want his smartness. I want his talents. Folks, if you're ex exhibiting the, the fruits of this world, then where are the fruits of the spirit by which you will know a man? You know, my job is not to lead you, to pick you up, you know, personally and carry you to Christ. My job is to say, there he is. You see this fruits in my life? You see this light? There's the light. I'm a reflection of that light. My job is like the, the, the spirit of Elijah before he comes back, and that is lead the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and the hearts of the sons back to the fathers. Who's the father? God. We're supposed to, you know, when you, when you talk about the prodigal son, who's the father? God. He's accepting everybody back who comes back out of their sin. He runs out to accept you. He's so happy that you've come back. If you were going to sit here and continuously proceed in this life in the same mannerisms that you proceeded in the creature, that the, the, the flesh that died upon the cross, 
where are you going to end up? Do you think you're going to end up at a different objective, a different location, a different destination? We as this nation, are we've been given the answer in Second Chronicles 7.14 that Solomon didn't follow. And what happened to Solomon? What happened to Israel? Immediately pitched into division, immediately pitched into civil war, immediately pitched into assaults by all the surrounding empires, and immediately within, what, 500 years? sold into captivity. God loves us so much that he will subject us to the training of our own chastisement to bring us back to him. But come back to him, we must. So this nation must recognize that the reason we're in the deep soup that we're in is because we walked away from God. We walked into the murky swamp. We, we enjoyed the odor, we enjoyed the pestilence, we enjoyed the bugs, we enjoyed the swamp creatures, and where are we because of it? Right where we wanted to be. The only way out of this, and that's the hope that we have in our hearts, that's what God says differentiates a, a Christian, is that we have a hope of redemption, we have a hope of a calling, we have a hope of a promise. We have a hope of an eventual glorification and inclusion with Christ in the new empire that he sets up to rule and reign forever and ever. That is what causes our hope. That is what causes our, our faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Folks, you want to get steeped in maturity in Christianity. You want to have a surety, a surety in this life, assurance. You want to have confidence. You want to have understanding. You want to have the power that everybody says knowledge is power? Well, then why aren't you studying the Bible? It's the source of knowledge. I'm just going to be real clear with you folks. The only way, way we became hard as Marines is to become hard as Marines and study and practice and perform. Because you will perform what you practice. And if you're pre practicing weak study, weak prayer, weak walk with the Lord, weak discipleship, weak projection and focus upon his his word in your heart, weak understanding of what's coming to face us so that you can prepare, what are you going to perform? You're going to perform weakly. And I don't mean w, double E weakly. I mean scrawny, unprepared, simple. It's time for us to take this as seriously as we take any other discipline in this world. How do you go to the Olympics? You take your discipline and you swallow it and you perform it every day until you become adept to the point of greater adaptation than your neighbor. You got Paul said, run this race like you plan to win it. Are you running this race like you plan to win it? Or are you going, boy, poor me, look at how, you know, I've got these things tied around my legs and arms. Christ set you free. If you want to stay in those prisons, that's by choice. If you want to be ready, I'm here to help, and there are many other people here to help. But I'm not going to carry you to the cross. I'm not going to carry you up the skinny path. Yes, I will pick you up at times and carry you for a short way as you're injured and do the greatest thing I can, which is pray for you. That's the greatest thing I can. It's not the, the, you know, the fallback plan. It is the plan. Trust the plan. The plan is trusting prayer in God, trusting privilege, trusting promise, trusting purpose, trusting the sovereign God Almighty who created everything and is in control of everything. Folks, we need to come to our own, you know, little chat with ourselves and say, okay, what is it that I believe? And does my action, do my words, do my actions indicate a complete faith in what I believe? Or am I just buffaloing? Am I just blowing smoke? I am not a smoke-blowing Christian. I don't want to be out here on the road, folks. But I know this is what God made me for. I don't want to be, I'm a homebody by nature. I don't want to be being a, the, the fisherman of men walking along and going to disparate areas. But you know what I have? I've fallen in love with it. 
because that's what God made me for. He made me to love him and love them. And the only way you can do that is you really know there's danger coming is you go to them and warn them. You go to them and love them. You go to them and help them through their circumstances you, with healing and prayer and love and, and understanding, not being in charge of the outcome, not trying to recruit for a church or, or build membership or bring in money, but to save them from the wrath to come. That's why Pilgrim's Progress was written. Run from the wrath that is coming. Folks, if you don't have fear of God and reverence of God, you're in a world of hurt. Because you fear anything here and you aren't paying attention to what's coming, the wrath of God, man, you are not going to be prepared. And it's time to be prepared. It's time, it's time of love. It's time of understanding. It's time of recognition of your walk as a Christian and what that means. What does it mean? I mean, what does it really mean if you don't do it? If you don't practice, if you don't ready. When Christ taught readiness and the apostles taught readiness to Christians, they were teaching to Christians. Why would you teach a Christian to be ready? Well, presumptively, logically, if you're not ready, something bad happens. What's that bad thing that happens? I'm going to leave you to have a discussion with the Lord, but I think you're going to find the same thing that I found 20 years ago is, A, I ain't doing it, and B, if I ain't doing it, do I believe it? And C, how do, we, how do I do it? <laughs> you know, Where do I go to perform my, my purpose? Where do I go to find the fulfillment built within my creation? Where do I go? Here's your destination. The moments of prayer you spend with the Lord, the moments listening to the Holy Spirit in his conveyance of, of the knowledge of the truth, in his conveyance of direction, in his conveyance of counsel, in his conveyance of, of power and peace in the midst of trial, in his, in his understanding and firmament of the promise upon your life. I love you folks, and the best thing I can do for you, the greatest power I have, it's not my power, but his. The power of prayer, the power found in the Holy Spirit that lives in, in mine and your hearts. The power of a body to heal the other parts of the body by, by perhaps stepping in and taking a little bit of the weight from the injured person. So I know all of us have a wound created by this world, created by you know, the abrasiveness of this world. In the wound is found the healing. And taking that wound to the Lord and saying, Lord, this is what happened to me. This is who I was. This is who died on the cross. This is from whom you have set me free. Thank you, Lord, that you've set me free to pr pursue the transformative power of your change, of your wonderful hands of, of mercy and grace and, and re reformation what we are facing right now is the call for revival what does the the call for revival portend it means that there's an area uh, an upcoming time when that revival is going to separate humanity those who are revived are going to escape wrath it's very clear you're going to escape something well what's coming Either you're escaping it, or you're being highly prepared and protected for it. And it's said very clearly in Revelation 13, 7, that, that he was given power to make war against the saints. Which saints? How can he say earlier in the gospel that Jesus promised that even the gates of hell shall not pr prevail against his church? Contradiction, right? So the logical ending to that contradiction is to have two separate bodies, just as the contradiction that, that the Jewish faithful have tripped over for ages is that Christ was supposed to die. He was karat, cut off, not of himself, but for, for those that he came to save. He came, he's, he had two comings. Biblically, they could not justify that. 
And are we in the same position now where we can't biblically understand that there's two comings? There's one for Hapatso to snatch us out of here where he doesn't land on the Mount of Olives. And then he comes back with us behind him and lands on the Mount of Olives. How is that possible without biblical understanding, without spiritual insight, without logical training in the word? And not holding tight to what I know. I am emphatic about my education and PhD and in, in, in theology. I want to tell you that you don't know. Well, I'm sorry. I'll give you the, the, the Nebraska or Kansas or Ohio farm boy clause. You're going to tell me that a guy that went and got his PhD in the Bible is smarter or more prepared in the Bible than a young man that's been sitting on, on that tractor his whole life studying this thing? Sorry, I don't agree. I don't agree. That's why I haven't gotten gone and gotten my PhD in theology, because the Lord said, I don't want you to be like them. There are many of those men, and we know them, who've put their names on the Bible. Oh, but this is my Bible. This is so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so's Bible. Not my Bible. This is God's Word. This is not for me to, to monetize and make money off of. This is, look, man, I'm not looking for money. I'm looking for exactly what God is saying I was supposed to be looking for. Storing up treasures in heaven that, that can't be stolen and won't rust, you know, will never die. That's you. That's the people I meet. That's the experiences I have through the Holy Spirit. Those are the only things I'll be able to take to heaven, are the people. That's I truly love you folks, not because just because of my own understanding of love, but because he loved me that way. That's what this is about. And my prayers for you, this day, for this nation, is to turn your hearts back to him. I mean fully. I mean whatever you're engaging, engage it with your whole gusto, everything you've got. And I'll tell you what, this always returns on investment always and it might be a thousandfold it might be a millionfold you don't know until you invest i love you folks and i pray the peace of god almighty and the lord jesus christ upon your lives but most of all i pray that you believe that what you ask for will be received we're facing the exact, we've all wished for, you know, a, a Christ purpose life, a, you know, exciting, adventure, mysterious life. That's what we've been given. But you have to choose it. That's, that is the catalyst of Christianity is choice. It's found in the choice and the recognition of that choice and saying, okay, I've chosen this. To, to reflect that, I need to see the fruits of the Spirit come out in my life. You will know a man by his fruits. Not everyone that comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, you know, don't you know us will inherit the kingdom of God. But he who does the will of my Father. Action, folks. Faith is action. Faith is a comprehension of what you've chosen and then a study and an, and an active participation in your faith. What are you doing? What does your life indicate? Are you still consuming the, the, the life-altering drugs that you consumed? Are you still practicing the sexual acts? Are you still practicing the manipulation? Are you still practicing the weakness that comes with no faith? Are you still being tossed about like a cork on the ocean by disparate idolism? It's time for us to recognize that if we're following the same old road, we're going to get to the same old destination. Christianity is not, there's nowhere in the Bible that says once saved, always saved. It doesn't say, in fact, 8, 8, Acts 8, 16, it disputes the whole idea that you've said of the prayer of contrition, you've taken a sprinkling of water, and suddenly you're done. That's not what the Bible teaches. The, the Bible teaches endurance. The word abide is endure. That's what it means. That's why he said abide 
because most people won't stop to figure out what abide means. It means to endure, which means that you have to practice, which means that you, Jesus said, you know, they came to him and said, you know, Lord, don't, don't you know us? We, we cast out demons in your name. We did many wonderful works in your name. And what does he say to them? Depart from me, you doers of iniquity, sinners. People are continuing in whatever acts they were in. They lack repentance. They lack contrition. They lack an understanding of what it means to be redeemed, means to be bought out of your slavery. Someone bought you. They own you. And that's Jesus Christ. He paid a price greater than anybody could ever offer for you because he loved you completely. God will, will provide the sacrifice, Abraham. And he did. Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary. He overpaid for all of us, but he paid for all of us nonetheless. What differentiates us from, from those that we, you know, call the lost or the fallen or whatever? It's that they've chosen wrongly. They've been deceived. They've listened to the voice of deception. So what is the job of an ambassador to a party that's been deceived that God loves and wants to come to him? That's to go to them and saying, hey, um, there's perhaps a deception here. Let me love you. And if there's anything I can do to aid you in making that choice that you have to make in the time allotted, you know, there's a range of time. It's 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 a timeline that's dictated by the Lord. And we're coming up on the end of the time of the Gentiles. If there's an end, there's something to be ready for. Logic. If there's an end, there's a there's a finish line. Logic. I mean, I'm not trying to be a jerk, folks. I'm trying to say, don't listen to even to your own voice that says, I got time. I got plenty of time just to sit around and putz around and do whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. I mean, all my sins have been forgiven. I can just sin, 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 sin. And all of a sudden, I'm going to, you know, appear in heaven. That's not the context. If you read several of Paul's letters, even once, you're going to see that he immediately dispels that context. That Acts 8.16 says very clearly that, that the Samaritans had, had said the prayer of contrition. They had been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and, and they had not had the Holy Spirit yet light upon them. The seal of Christianity is the Holy Spirit. The empowerment of, the, of, of Christianity is the Holy Spirit. The the earnest money of our salvation is the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1. The, the power of the Holy Spirit is, is, is what armors us against, the, you know, what gives us the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruits of which, which Christ was, you know, clarifying in, in Matthew 7, 7.20 and thereon. If you don't demonstrate the fruits of the Holy Spirit, you have no presence of the Holy Spirit, which means you ain't saved. How, how clear does a man have to be? I mean, that's as clear as I can put it. If you are running according to denominational belief, you are running as a member of church and believing that your parents are going to save you, your grandfather's belief is going to save you, you're, you're, you can just continue on your happy, sinful way and you've got to get out of, get out of hell free card. Guess what? That's not what this Bible says. It says exactly the opposite. It says, be holy even as I am holy. Set yourself apart. The, the whole purpose of the body of Christ is, is the perfection of the saints. Paul said, our responsibility as pastors and evangelists and apostles is to present you holy without blame before the king. How can I do that if I don't teach you to pursue a doctrine of perfection, a doctrine of holiness, a doctrine of purity. What, what fiancé ever got into a good marriage and wasn't pure during, during the betrothal? If you're out there sleeping with people who are not your husband before you've gotten married, what does that say? That's not a doctrine of purity. We used to be respected around the world in this nation because we followed 
a doctrine of purity. That's what they respected, is that we set ourselves apart. We believed in certain inalienable rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that we set up a republic that was going to stick to a constitution, a set of, of rules that we agreed upon in our hearts, a stewardship to the Lord for a nation that we were given. Our lives, our treasure, our sacred honor under the, the, the divine providence we were proclaiming to God that we were going to live by a certain set of rules in this nation, and we haven't. Now we're caught up in the denomination, denominational church. We're caught up in the, the apostate church. We're caught up in the, 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 the church of Thyatira that's going to go into tribulation. Who do, where do we think we're going if we're following them? Who are these people to speak for Christ? They don't have the right to call themselves the voice of Christ. They aren't. There's nobody between you and God. How can we insert somebody between us and God when there's nobody there? How can there be a hierarchy in the church when God hates it? I mean, I'm speaking truths here, and these are biblical truths. I'll back it up, and I've backed it up for years and years in this Bible, in his word. Not in my own understanding. Not in my PhD, because I got none. You know, that's that's probably the, the largest recrimination they use against a knucklehead like me, who's anointed by Christ. They go, well, where's your credentials? Where's your last name that's, you know, that's empirically appears upon the stone at the at the, the the entry of the churchway. How can you claim to have any authority? Well, as Paul did, Paul was one of those with his name on the churchway, and he threw it all away. He said, I count it all trash for Christ. I, I count it all gone. He gave it away. God renamed him. He became somebody else. He became poor. He became just as Jesus became poor. They didn't come with their own credentials. Why would our examples not have their own credentials? Why would God always use poor people? Why would God always use the the low, the the meek, the you know those who are unex who are not expected to to rise to glory? Because it's to demonstrate His glory, not my own. You know, I call all my stuff filthy rags. I don't care. I'm glad my past has led me here. I'm glad it has sufficiently prepared me for here. That's the treasure of my past. The treasure of my future is you. I love you, folks. I truly love you. And in loving you, I know that you have a choice to make. And if for those who have made it, amen and amen, walk that walk, folks. Run that race. Stand, in, 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 regardless of who threatens you, stand even unto death on, uh, upon that promise, upon the person that you're supposed to be. And you'll never go wrong. You're, you're going to be challenged. Let me tell you what. And the challenges are always beyond what I can handle. These people make up statements and, and colloquialisms, you know, not God never gives you more than you can handle. No, 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 that's not what the Bible says. It says God will always provide an escape. <laughs> you know, and, so Joseph had to run down the street naked, right? Get away from Potiphar's wife. You'll always get things that are beyond you, and that's the rub. That's the mystery. That's the joy. That's the treasure of Christianity is, look, I'm facing the impossible. But wait a minute. I have the power that created the entire universe living in my heart. I have the ability to do miracles in my heart. Nothing is impossible for him who believes. That's the training. Is a reliance upon him, not on yourself. You're no longer relying upon yourself. Why would you rely upon yourself? 
now that you're no longer reliant upon yourself. Logic. I mean, come on, folks. This starts to make real sense to those who believe. And that's our objective here is that we become so firm, so full in the fullness of Christ, so rounded by the knowledge and the trust and the relationship in him, that we begin to reflect him and we're not no longer enticed or deceived by this world. That's, that's the purpose. Ephesians 4, read it. Read this Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. If you don't want to follow me, follow somebody that you really, truly believe is teaching this Bible. I don't care if you remember me. I care that, that I gave you whatever catalyst it was that was necessary to make that choice, to make it with all that you are, everything you've got. Give everything to this. It is the greatest investment and the greatest return you will ever see. Not for, not for person, but for Christ. I love you, and I thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. I, I look forward to speaking with you again, and I hope you forgive me my inadequacies. Look, I'm not frustrated in anybody. I'm emphatically speaking with power and authority given me by the Holy Spirit to perhaps get you to look upon your own lives and make that choice. And any help I can give you to perfect the saints to conduct the ministry or to edify this body, please call upon me. I love you and I thank you for the opportunity to meet with you today and proclaim this name, not my own, in the name of Jesus Christ your King. Amen and amen.